Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Louis. Uh, I am a member of the Boost community. Uh, I am the author of Boost HANA, uh, a metaprogramming library. And recently, I've been, um, I, I've been exploring a little bit um, uh, the, the realm of runtime polymorphism. So like, you know, inheritance, virtual functions, and, and alternatives to that. Uh, and that's the, uh, the topic today. So um, just a quick note, these slides are currently up. They're online. If you want to, uh, maybe, you know, if you have questions or something and you want to spend more time on a slide, just go to that URL and it's there. And the source code, all the source code that I, uh, I'm presenting today and also the, the, you know, source code for the slides, um, it's some HTML JavaScript thing, um, is available there. So um, if you're interested, just go check it out. Um, all right, so before we spend an hour and a half um, talking about polymorphism, we better know, you know, what, what it is. Um, and so nothing here is going to be new to anyone, I guess, but I still just want to cover it real quick. So imagine you have a set of classes and they are related by their interface, right? They're related by the fact that they all, say, have an accelerate method or could be something else, draw or, you know, whatever. Um, and imagine you want to uh, return any of an object of any one of these types from a function. That's easy, usually. Except if you don't know what type you're going to be returning at compile time, if it depends on, for example, a you know, uh, uh, user input or something like that, then you can't just return uh, either a car, a truck, or a plane. Right? Because those have different types. You'll need to settle on one single representation and return, you know, always return that. So usually what, what we do there is we're basically going to, you know, have a base class and we're going to return basically a pointer to that base class, which is actually going to be pointing to a, uh, one of any one of these derived classes. So anyway, um, in a case where you have, you want to return one of you know, many different types based on a runtime condition, that, that's you know, a place where you need runtime polymorphism. Um, another very similar uh, uh, place where you need to do that is when you want to store related types in a container. Right? You need to settle on a single fixed representation that is going to be able to represent all the, the actual you know, dynamic types that you want to put in, in the container and, um, and store that in the container. Right? So you, obviously you cannot have a car, a truck, and a plane in a vector as is because the vector just takes, you know, just holds objects of a single type. And sometimes variant is enough, right? So if you know what the set of types that you have, right, if you know what it is, then you can use variant. If you don't, for example, if you're providing a library and maybe your, you know, the, the, um, your users can extend your library by providing you know, new types that satisfy some uh, interface, then you might, you might not, you know, this might not be a possibility. Um, and also using visitation, it's kind of a minor detail, I guess, but visitation is not always convenient, really. Like sometimes you'd just like the, you know, to call the method that accelerate as opposed to doing std visit, blah, 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 right? Um, so, um, but really, the, the, the main point here is it only works for closed set of types. That's, that's really, really important. So the bottom line is you need runtime polymorphism when you, need, when you have a, uh, an open set of types, right? So it's open. It's not closed. You don't know what it is uh, right away. And they have a related interface. All of them have a related interface, but they have different representations. Does that make sense? And by the way, ask questions as we go. We're good. Okay. So of course, C++ has a solution for that, and it's called inheritance. Uh, so what we do usually is, uh, if I have you know uh, a car, a truck, and a plane, they all have the same interface more or less. Um, I can define a base class, say vehicle, uh, and then in order to, um, and then I have you know this virtual function, um, uh, accelerate, which is then overridden in my derived classes. Makes sense, right? Um, and of course, you need to make the, uh, uh, the structure virtual because other th otherwise, you know, bad things could happen. But it's just an implementation detail. And under the hood, can can you all see properly? Even at the back, that's that's clear. Okay, that's important because we're going to have a bunch of them uh, of these diagram diagrams. So so under the hood, the compiler um, is going to generate a V table, right? So based on 
the definition of your base class vehicle, uh, it knows that it needs a vtable with two entries here. It needs one entry to store a pointer to accelerate, right, to the actual implementation of accelerate, and one for the destructor. And then you're going to have so car is going to so, so the, the vehicle here. What, what's in the vehicle defines the the, the layout of the vtable, right? Defines what needs to be in in any vtable. And then when you define a derived class like car, that's when you create a you know, a specific vtable which satisfies that layout, right? And, when, and, and then in that vtable, you say, well, it's that specific implementation of Accelerate that I'm using. Makes sense? And that specific destructor that I'm using. And of course, the way it works is typically, um, typically what we do is we, you know, manipulate these, these as pointers to base classes. So that's why I'm using, you know, vehicle star here. Uh, and then you have the actual uh, dynamic type, right? Which in which might be, for example, a car, and, and then it might have, you know, maybe a, a string, an int, and other members, data members, whatever. Um, and the important point here is it has a pointer to that vtable. Mm -hmm. And if you want to call, say, accelerate on this vehicle star, what's going to happen, of course, is uh, you'll go get the vtable, the, the, you, you'll, you know, follow the pointer to the vtable that's in the car, and, and then you'll, you'll, you'll do an indirect call through the, the function pointer that, that you know, um, resides in that V table. Everybody's following so far? So that's, that's how it works, right? Um, before we go, you know, before we uh, uh, go further, uh, I just want to uh, make a quick aside uh, and talk about a few of the problems of in inheritance. Uh, I don't want to talk about it too much. This is not the, 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 the goal, but um, I think it's still important to frame some of those problems because otherwise it we already have a solution, which I just presented. It's called inheritance. Why would we, you know, spend like the dog's done, right? Um, so I want to explain, you know, a couple of problems with this. So uh, one pretty big problem is that it bakes in reference semantics, because we have to manipulate uh, uh, pointers to, ba to base classes, right? Um, I mean, we, we we lose the ability to copy our objects. Which, which is something super useful in C++. You, can, you have you know, an object, you make a copy, and the copies are, are disjoint. That's, that's super, right? Um, but of course, this is not possible when you start using inheritance. Or, I mean, you can do it, but you have to define your own clone method, right? Can you raise your hand if you've seen that before? Like that idiom of, oh, okay, like everybody, right? So what you're doing then is you're basically Re-implementing copy constructor, the copy constructor, right? It's it's morally it's it, it is a copy constructor, right? That clone method, except it's doing a dynamic allocation and it's a little more complicated, but it's basically a copy constructor. And so the fact that we um, that we lose value semantics or that we lose um, easy to use value semantics with this with inheritance is I find very frustrating. Uh, but doesn't it come from the fact that we? use the same construct, the class, to actually implement two very different things. On one hand, value types, which need copy semantics, and on the other hand, objects, which are identity, and which, in general, you don't want to copy. And, and in, in general, you disable copy, uh, the copy constructor in those cases. So the question is, does that, tell me if, if I get it right. Um, I, I'm saying that you lose, you know, easy to use value semantics. And your question is, does that stem from the fact that actually these are objects and they shouldn't be copied anyway, right? Or because of what I'm saying, which is just, it's just cumbersome, right? Um, I think in, in, there are some cases where you have objects and you don't really want to copy them, but I, I also claim that in many cases you have uh, values and, and, you know, basically these polymorphic thingies, they're actually acting as values and you want to copy them around and you, like, it makes perfect sense to do that. That, I guess that's just my yeah, claim. I can think of examples indeed. Hmm? I can think of examples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think there is, like, you know, both cases. Um, and, of course, because we're manipulating pointers uh, and, you know, we don't know exactly how the, I mean, we don't know the size of the actual, you know, vehicle. It's not a vehicle, it's, a, it's like a car or maybe it's a truck, maybe it's a plane. Like, we don't know the size of that. And all, we're, all, all that we're uh, manipulating is actually a pointer to that. So um, we kind of have to allocate on the heap, usually, right? We don't have to. Technically speaking, we can create like a, a car on the, on the stack and then pass a pointer or a reference to that. 
um, to a function, right? And that's just going to work. That's going to work just fine. The problem is, um, it you know, then you have the scoping issues. So um, typically, you end up with uh, heap allocations when when you start using inheritance. And that's kind of unfortunate as well. Um, and because we're using pointers, suddenly all of our our, our, our objects, they're all nullable, right? Because a pointer can be null. So you always have to check or live dangerously. And, um, and, and that's just not what you wanted. You wanted to have you know, anything that satisfies the vehicle interface. You didn't want to have anything that satisfies the vehicle interface or nothing at all, right? So it's kind of a really unfortunate uh, uh, side effect. And of course, when we start using pointers, ownership becomes a problem. It, 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 you know, it raises some questions that we, we suddenly have to answer. Um, so who's owning my, uh, uh, this, the, this memory? Uh, and then you have to basically decide on uh, one of our uh, you know, fun and nice smart pointer types or you know, just a raw pointer. But uh, we all know, you know it, it, it just forces us to an answer some questions that we just shouldn't be answering in the first place. That's, that's what, you know, we have pretty good answers for memory management in C++. It's just that we shouldn't have to answer these questions in the first place. We are doing polymorphism, not like, you know, we're, we're not doing, we, we don't actually need to go to the heap there. And because we're using pointers, it also doesn't play well with standard algorithms, right? It just, like all of our code, all the, the C++ language is built on values, and suddenly we don't have values, so it doesn't work really well. So if you have a vector, for, for example, of these vehicles, actually pointers to vehicles, and you try to sort that on you know, some property, um, it's not going to work, right? Uh, you'll, you'll actually have to provide your own predicate and then say, oh, actually dereference the vehicle, you know, and maybe sort on that you know, sub-property of the vehicle or something. So, all the nice, all the, the, um, the little bits of the language that work nicely with values, suddenly they don't work so nicely, so naturally uh, anymore because you're using pointers. So, you know, it won't kill you, but it's kind of, it's, it's just more cumbersome. It, it's, it's always, uh, you're kind of fighting against the, uh, the, uh, the current here. Um, and it's intrusive because you have, like, if you, if you have a new type, uh, if you have a, uh, maybe a type in a, in a third party library that you don't control or something like that, and you want that type to be usable with your interface, uh, well, basically what you need to do is make your base class, you, you need to have this, you know, this third party type inherit from, from, from the base class, and that doesn't work because you can't modify it. Uh, so that's, that's also a really big problem. So that's about it. Like, I don't want to rent. More than that, you should, you should listen, listen to uh, Sean Parent. He, uh, he's got uh, very, very good talks about this. Uh, this one is, um, I think, Inheritance is the base class of, uh, of evil, or, or, or I think it's this, this talk. So um, you should definitely uh, go and watch this talk. It's, it's, personally, I think it's one of the best talks that I've, I've seen in my life. You should definitely uh, uh, watch, watch this one. Yeah. I'd like to make a quick statement. Just because it's funny doesn't mean that it's true, OK? Um, if, if you derive a square from a rectangle and a rectangle can have its uh, size adjusted, it says nothing about inheritance, it says something about you. Probably that you're trying to build a Foreman argument. I'm not saying you personally, Louis, uh, Louis right? Uh, you in general. I'm, I'm not sure I understand what. Uh, I, I'm not saying that it, like, inheritance is necessarily bad in all cases. That's not what I, that's the point I'm trying to make. Um, it's bad for what it was designed for. That's what I'm trying to see, say. It's fine. It's fine. I, I use inheritance, like to use the empty base optimization, but I, I don't. I don't like to use it for the, the way it was designed. Anyway, that's just. Well, I think we have better solutions too. I mean, they're kind of hard to implement, as we'll see in this talk. But um, yeah, I mean, but I understand peop, some people can disagree with me for sure. Um, so really, what I wanted was something like this. It's. It's. I want to be able to specify my interface, okay, in um, some way. This is obviously not real C++, right? Just want to say that's an interface, and then just have uh, uh, different types that satisfy the interface without being intrusive. Notice that they do not uh, uh, have a base class, right? And just have them be able to satisfy, be, um, be usable as a vehicle. And when I have my std vector of vehicle, 
here, I really mean, I mean, in this magic world, I really mean that I have an actual object, you know, that might be a car, a plane, or a, a truck, or whatever. I actually have an object like that in my vector, right? I don't care about how it's stored. We, we're going to talk about it later. But um, I, like, this is a, this, this does not have the semantics of a pointer to a vehicle. It has the real semantics of having an actual vehicle, a little bit like a variant, right? So if you copy one of these magic vehicles around, you're actually copying the thing that it, that it, that it contains, right? That it, that it is, so uh, maybe a car, maybe a motorcycle, whatever. Um, and, and so that, that way we would have polymorphism with, uh, uh, non, well, I mean, non-intrusive polymorphism with value semantics, which I, I think is, is kind of nice, right? So that's kind of where I want to go, okay? Um, and so the remainder of this talk is going to be about how we can implement this interface keyword, okay? We're, I'm going to talk about different ways that we can implement this magic vehicle type. So uh, specifically, I'm going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about how we, uh, different ways that we can store the actual, the actual, uh, you know, uh, uh, truck or plane or whatever inside the vehicle and also how we can implement the, uh, the, the dispatching, the method dispatching. So essentially, you know, virtual uh, table dispatching. So we're going to uh, look at a bunch of techniques for that. So if you don't think that's interesting, you should leave right now because the rest of the talk is going to be about, you know, different ways, different ways that you can implement that. Questions? Sweet. Okay. Well, just, what's your ground rule is? Like within the language or if you modify the language slightly? Um, so within the language. I'm just, be, because, so I'm, I want to present basically general techniques. Not, you know, they're not really specific. They're, they're just, they're, they're general techniques that you could apply for that kind of, of, you know, solving that kind of problem. You could also apply when, for example, in, when implementing uh, stood string, you know, with the small string optimization. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll get into that later. But so uh, about general techniques that you can do in C++ right now. And then I actually at the end, I have hopefully, you know, 25, 30 minutes or so where uh, then we're going to go into uh, uh, the future, uh, if you will. Uh, we're going to talk about how we could get that um, uh, in, in, you know, in the language later on. Uh, and so we're going to talk about reflection, meta classes, and lots of metaprogramming. So I, I'm hoping to, to, to uh, get something like 25 minutes, maybe uh, talk about that at the end. But all the rest is implementable right now in C++ 14 17. Okay, so um, like I said, with inheritance, we basically have a uh, vtable pointer and so we have a pointer to a vtable and then the vtable contains the, uh, the objects, okay? And um, the way I'm going to explore this, this design space for how to implement this magic vehicle type is by looking at two different aspects of it. You can think about like two different policies in a way. Um, and we're going to treat them separately. So the first one is a storage policy. It's how we store the actual object within that magic vehicle. Okay. So do we store a pointer to something allocated on the heap, or do we have a buffer of a certain size? And you know what kind of what what what, what can we do there? So storage only. And then I'm going to talk about how you can dispatch. So like the dispatching component for how what happens when you call a, a virtual method on one of these magic vehicles. Make sense? So first is remote storage, OK? Um, basically, the vehicle is like a fat pointer. It's two pointers, OK? There's one pointer to the V table, but I don't want us to talk about it right now, because like I said, I'm going to treat it later on. So we have some pointer to a V table, and that takes care of dispatching. But it doesn't really matter at this point. And then we have a pointer to some data which in this case is a car. But it, you know, that's where basically you could substitute a car or maybe you could have a motorcycle or whatever else, right? Um, and so I call that remote storage because the storage is uh, remote to the vehicle itself. There's a pointer, the storage is on the heap, and um, that's how it works. So how you could, you, like, I mean, you might be, imp uh, you could implement it that way. So um, uh, you have a pointer to the V table, you have a void star pointer to whatever, right? And the interesting bit is uh, starts on line uh, six here and all the way until line 11 is when, uh, so you can create a vehicle from any type that satisfies the 
write interface, so you would have some Sphena thingy there, right, to make sure that this constructor cannot be um, uh, uh, used with an int, for example, and you know weird stuff like that. But so you can take any type that satisfies the interface, and what happens there? Well, you go get the V table for that specific type, right? So I'm assuming here. I'll show you later, but. I'm assuming here that I have some V table, some static V table somewhere that corresponds to that, to that uh, type. So I take the pointer to that and I save it. And then I just create, uh, and then I just allocate uh, one of these, like any of these concrete types on the heap, keep a pointer to it, and I'm done. And then when I want to call accelerate, I just go through my V pointer, right? I just go into the V table and, and, and fetch the function pointer that's there and call that on my actual on my void pointer, which really you know contains a car or whatever else, right? And in my destructor, um, well, I, I call the, the the virtual destructor basically, but I do that manually. Okay, so I'm obviously I'm not expecting anyone to write that, and like don't go and do that in your code base. It's probably not a great idea. It's a little low level, and I, I don't know, but I would probably not you know recommend that. But it's so that you can see how this actually works under the hood, or this could work under the hood. Richard, did you have a question? I think you. Yeah, I was like, I was like, are you going to delete the V table? But you're just grabbing a V table. It's static. So the, the, and you're just plop down. Yeah. So the, the, the question was, are you going to delete the V table or something? The, the V table is static. I'm just getting a, uh, it's, you know, it's a static const expert something, a table somewhere. And I'm just taking an address to that. So, I mean, const expert doesn't matter. It's, it's at runtime. But it's static const V table somewhere. I'm just grabbing the pointer. OK. So that's how you could implement that. Everybody's understanding uh, on line you know, uh, 6, 7, and 8 that this is a templated constructor. And that's like the essence of what we call type erasure here, is I have my templated constructor. Therefore, I can get constructed from anything that satisfies the right interface if you constrain the template. And the cool thing here is my class is not a template. My class, there is a one single type, which is well you know, understood, well pinned down. This is my single representation. But I can hide anything, any type that satisfies the interface by going through this templated constructor. So that's, that's like a really, really fundamental part of type erasure. What is the uh, delete underscore method? Oh, the delete underscore, OK, the question is, what is the delete underscore method? It's just a virtual destructor. Um, it's, it's, it, uh, basically, my V table here is going to contain something like the um, uh, accelerate and also delete underscore, which in this case would would just call the operator delete uh, on the you know with the right dynamic type, right? So it would just um, yeah, it would essentially call the destructor of whatever I I passed into my um, uh, constructor and also delete the memory associated to it. So it's it's a little more than a destructor. It's really like operator delete. So um, here is how you can. Do the V table. Um, can we kind of kind of uh, going to go fast on that? But uh, a V table is what is just a struct, right, with a bunch of member uh, uh, with a bunch of uh, pointers to function pointers in it. So a V table can be created by with this struct, and then you can initialize one of like an instance of this V table layout. By here, I'm using lambdas. Uh, it's kind of fancy, but it's it, it's easy to do. So a V table for a T, uh, for example, the accelerate method, which is the first one here, uh, line eight, nine, and ten, um, takes a void star because I like from the outside I don't know what my type is, but from the inside I know that actually my void star is pointing to a T, right? Because I I'm the V table for T, uh, so then I can safely static cast my my void pointer that this underscore here can static cast that to a T star and call accelerate on it, and that's a static uh, dispatch here. This uh, accelerate call is an actual, you know, a real normal function call. It's not virtual, it's not, nothing like that, right? At this point, because we know the T, and I've just done my static cast, I'm doing a static dispatch. And um, the second uh, uh, function here, which is delete underscore, is, is basically, like I said, the operator delete. Make sense for everybody here? Sweet. Um, so I got this little library called Dino. Um, I'm not really going to go in, in, into the details of it. Um, it's not the point. I just, there's one thing I want to show here. Um, so, so this library basically allows me to, to um, define interfaces. I have like this domain specific language that allows me to define interfaces. And I have this dino poly, which is kind of a, a stood any, but it, it implements uh, specific interfaces, right? 
And the cool part uh, with it is that you can, you can specify uh, different policies for how you want the poly to be implemented internally. So that's what I call the storage policy. And here you can see it underlined on line 10. Well, it's, it's on line 9, right? Uh, underlined, I'm using dyno remote storage. So that tells my, my dyno poly. That tells the poly to um, use this implementation strategy that I just showed here, where basically it's going to be um, it's going to be storing the actual object through a point. It's going to be storing it on the heap, okay? And the um, uh, and I'm kind of going to gloss over the rest, but like on line six here, um, just to uh, just to give you an idea of how that works, um, poly has this you know uh, virtual underscore method, which basically does the, the, the V table lookup for me. Um, this accelerate underscore S string here is not a real string. It's, it's a compile time string. So what this ends up being is essentially like a, a, a struct access. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a, conceptually, it's a map lookup. I'm looking up what's the implementation of accelerate for that, you know, for whatever is in the poly, and then calling that on the poly itself. Uh, but but so, so that's conceptually, but in terms of implementation, it's really just a, a struct access because all, all this stuff is determined in compile time. Yeah. Um, so if I can recap this for myself, I'm not sure if I follow you completely. This looks like the exact same setup that you have with a virtual uh, vehicle, except that instead of having a new pointer to a virtual vehicle with its own V table pointing it further, you voice the V table into the new pointer. And that should be essentially what you now have. So the comment is the comment is um, uh, that essentially the difference between this and having a uh, real virtual, uh, just you know, virtual vehicle, um, is that is that right now I have basically two pointers: one that points to the the storage, and one that points to the V table. And in term, in, in case of inheritance, I would most likely have a pointer to something which has a pointer to the V table. Right? That is correct. That that's absolutely correct. That's the only difference right now. Um, the, um, what you're going to see a little later is, is that I'm going to present different ways that you can store your object. And by just changing this little storage policy here, changing nothing else, um, we're going to be able to, to you know, ex explore different ways that you can store the, the, the thing under the hood. Um, there's also another difference, actually, is that this poly here has uh, value semantics. So when I copy this vehicle, you know, it, it behaves kind of like a std any, as opposed to be behaving as a pointer, which does not copy anything, really. Okay, so this thing has uh, value semantics. Anyway, so just just want to show that this is possible. Um, yeah, like I said, I have a, a uh, domain specific language that allows me to spe to define interfaces. This is kind of a um, proof of concept to show how like how much we need like what we can do in the library realm in C plus plus, and 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 that's kind of convincing me that yeah we can can do cool stuff, but we're going to need some more language, you know. Uh, support because I don't expect anyone here to write this. Um, but anyway, so that specifies basically my interface here. I say I'm copy constructible, destructible, and I have an accelerate method which uh, returns void and takes a T ref. T is like the, you know, whatever is going to, whatever I'm trying to erase. Okay. And so the strength and uh, uh, weaknesses of this approach, the, uh, the remote storage approach, what, you know, whether you implement it with Dino or manually or whatever, um, is mostly that the, the model is very similar to classic inheritance. So it's really simple. Uh, the problem is it always requires an allocation, which is you know, kind of uh, uh, annoying. But at least you've got value semantics at this point. So that's cool. Um, who knows about the small string optimization? OK. So uh, essentially, the small string optimization is, um, is where if you have a really, really small string that you want to put in a std string, for example, um, well, std string could have a buffer of a certain size. And if the, the string is small enough to, you know, if it happens to fit in that, in, in that buffer that it has locally inside the std string, then it can skip the allocation. It could, can just put the string right there and, and not you know, go to the heap. And of course, if it's too long, then well, you have to, to, to actually do an allocation. So that general pattern, th that's actually a more general pattern, right? The, the small string optimization is, is what's called the small buffer optimization applied to strings. So the small buffer optimization is where you, um, like I said, you basically just have a, 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 a buffer locally. And if whatever you want to, hold, you know, you're like a container or something. If you, whatever you want to hold happens to fit in the buffer, then, oh, you just placement new it inside the, the buffer locally, right? So you just construct it right there. And if it doesn't fit, well, oh, damn it, then you need to go to the heap, right? 
Um, so that's a really general pattern. So um, this is kind of a naive implementation of it. Uh, it's, it's not really good to have this bool there, but um, I'll show other ones. So essentially, in, in, in this implementation strategy, we have a pointer to the vtable. That doesn't change. Okay, I don't want to get, get deeper into that. And then um, you have a, a bit of information, essentially, that tells you whether the thing that you're holding fit in the buffer or not. And then you have either a pointer to something on the heap or you have the buffer you know, itself. So if the, if the car happens to fit inside my buffer of size n, then I, it's going to be in, in the buffer, and otherwise my pointer is going to point to it. Make sense? OK. Uh, so one way you could implement that is uh, by uh, essentially having a union and then some aligned storage of whatever size you want, uh, and then some bit of information that tells you whether the thing is, is on the heap or, or, or not. And, and the interesting bit is from line 7 to uh, 16, the template, templated constructor, where, uh, again, I can be constructed from anything that satisfies my interface. Imagine I have some constraints in there. Um, so I get the V table pointer. That's, that doesn't change. And then if I see that the size of the object, right, if the, the type that I'm being constructed from uh, doesn't fit in the buffer, then I'm, I know I'm going to have to go to the heap. So I say, all right, you're going to be on the heap, right, on line, line 10. And then I allocate my vehicle on the heap on line 11, right? And if it happens to fit in the buffer, then I say on line 13, no, you're not going to be on the heap. And, um, and I just placement new it in, in, the, in the buffer itself. So I'm assuming uh, line 14 is not puzzling anyone. Placement new. Raise your hand if you are not familiar with that. OK, good. Um, and so on line, uh, so then the method accelerate on line 18 and 19. Um, basically, I I, when I want to uh, uh, do a, a virtual uh, table dispatch here, I always go to the V table. That doesn't change. And then I have to know where my object is. So I check whether I'm on the heap. And if so, I'm going to use a pointer. So if, if, I'm, if my bool is true, then I know that the active element of my union is PDR underscore, right? So then I use that. And otherwise, I just send the address of the buffer which I know is, um, is the object that I placement nude in there. That, does that make sense to everyone? Questions? Yeah. That's right. I, uh, the, the comment is I'm not checking the alignment of the, of the, of the type. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I mean, obviously, Dino does it. Uh, it's just this is uh, slideware. Uh, but yeah, so like, don't go and copy paste any of this code, please. Um, yeah, that wouldn't be a good idea. I'm um, seeing line 14 that you're using placement new without storing return values, which means that the buffer itself still isn't annotated as being that type. It smells like the case where it's then what's still on there. So the comment is on line 14, I am not, um, I, I am not uh, uh, storing the result value of this placement new anywhere. And therefore, the compiler doesn't know that my aligned storage um, is actually of dynamic type uh, any capital A, right? Um, and uh, that is correct. So in fact, I believe that what I would need to do is, um, I don't think I need to store the result value anywhere. I think what I need to do instead is whenever I access my, my buffer uh, in on line 19 in Accelerate, that is where I would need to use std yeah. Um And I'm actually not sure of that. I I think it might only be necessary if I allowed changing the dynamic type afterwards. So if I had like a copy assignment or a move assignment operator that allowed changing the type of what's in the vehicle, then I think I, I would need Lander. I would definitely need Lander there. I am not sure I need Lander right now because it's uh, aligned storage, which, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not too sure. Given that there wasn't an any in that place before, that shouldn't be an issue. But if you allow replacing the any with the same kind of any and it had a console reference number, then the compiler would be able to uh, assume that it hadn't changed when it did. I fully agree with that. So the comment is, if I did allow change, like replacing the any by a new any, or or you know changing to a different type of maybe from car to plane or whatever, then absolutely the compiler would be allowed to uh, assume. Say, say if that you know car or plane has a uh, uh, const uh, reference member or something like that, 
um, or if, if it has like a V table, for example, it would not have to reload these. Uh, and, and that's true. That's where you need to launder. But I, I don't think that in this specific case, because I'm not implementing this functionality, I don't think I need to use launder. But this, yeah, this is, this is kind of tricky. Other questions? OK. Uh, so there are other ways to implement the small buffer optimization. The one I showed is, uh, is not really the most optimal. So um, you could go and store the, uh, the bit of information saying whether you're on the heap. You could store that in the V table. Actually, what you could do, even uh, thanks Marshall, um, uh, pointed that out at CppCon, is you could just embed the knowledge of whether you're on the heap or not in the implementation of the V tables methods, right? So basically, the given a buffer size and a V table, because a V table is, you know, belongs to a specific type. So given a buffer size and a specific type, you can always tell whether it's going to fit in that buffer or not, right? I mean, you, you have the size of the type, you have the size of the buffer. Therefore, the V table, if, if the V table is aware of the size of the buffer, right, which it could be, you know, if, if you give it the, that knowledge, um, then it, this, the, uh, the accelerate method, for example, could, could take a void star, um, which represents the union, and it could know right away whether it's, in the, uh, it's on the heap or on the local buffer. Without, it would know that statically, right? So that's, that's actually even much better. That's not shooting down it. Huh? Steven, sorry, Steven. <sighs> yeah. So the disadvantage of that approach is that now different buffer sizes are completely incompatible with each other. That's correct. So the comment is that now the disadvantage of doing that is that different buffer sizes are now incompatible with each other. That's true. Yeah. So it's all about trade-offs at this point. But yeah, I, I fully agree. Yeah. Uh, another implementation strategy, which does not have this downside, is the following. So what you can do is you always have a pointer to, the st to your storage. Okay. And so that's the pointer that you're always going to follow. However, you're clever. That pointer might be pointing to the heap, or it might be pointing right after itself into a buffer. Right? So instead of using a bool here, I have this void star storage underscore pointer, which if, if the thing fit in the buffer, which is, which is located just after, then storage points just after itself. And otherwise, it's going to point to the heap. Which means that when I dispatch, I always follow the storage underscore pointer. And that might bring me to the heap, or right after myself in the local buffer. Right? And then I can retrieve that bit of information for, for, for example, when I need to destroy my object. That's where, if it's in the local buffer, I just need to call the destructor. But if it was allocated in a heap, I need to call the destructor and free that memory. Right? So I need that to, to get back that bit of information. Well, it's really easy. What you can do is just check whether storage points right after itself. Right? That tells you whether the SBO was used or not. So if storage points right after itself, then you know that basically the thing is in the, the local storage, and then you don't need to deallocate. You just need to, to, uh, um, uh, to call the destructor. And, and if it doesn't, then you know it's pointing somewhere on the heap. And then you know, that's some uh, resources you need to deallocate. Yeah? Um, you have the V-table pointer, and you're pretty much guaranteed that the bottom one or two bits are going to be zeros. You're only needing one extra bit of storage. If you consider folding the uh, yes. on heap into the viewpoint storage, yeah, so another comment is you can actually store this bit of information in, by doing some bit twiddling in the uh, low bits of your vtable pointer um, because you know, you know that, that the, there's some uh, alignment guarantee um, because of the contents of your vtable. So yeah, yeah, that's also something you could do. I was actually going to mention it. Yeah. So that's absolutely true. Uh, I mean, it does mean, though, that you need to do this bit twiddling any time that you access your object, which might not be the best. Um, Measure, 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 right? But it, yeah, it's entirely possible. So, so you need this bit of information. You're free to store it, to represent it however you want. Uh, you can go really fancy. Uh, so with Dino, uh, the interesting part here is that this is exactly the same slide as before. Nothing changed, except line 9, where I went from remote storage to SBO storage 16, right? That tells basically the underlying poly with tons of metaprogramming, it tells it, it tells it you need to, like your um, storage implementation should be using a SBO buff, like a buffer with, with size 16, right? Uh, so that's the only thing you need to change, nothing else. So that's, that's what I like from this policy-based approach is you, you know, you do your, your things and then you're like, oh, oh, let me play with some, you know, a few parameters, like, and you just, you know, change one line basically, and, and then you get different performance profiles. 
which is which can be interesting. Yeah. I'm assuming iVehicle comes from that uh, domain specific language compilation. That That's correct. Yeah. So I uh, so the the question is I'm assuming that uh, uh, the the, the uh, comment is uh, they're assuming that the the iVehicle is coming from that domain specific language. So I actually showed it earlier. Uh, it's right here. The struct iVehicle line one here. Um, that's essentially the that that okay in that specific in that domain specific language it represents an interface mm -hmm. so um, as you can see I say you know Dino requires copy constructible destructible and that method so so conceptually what this is doing it's it's telling me what my vtable layout needs to be right this it tells me that I'm going to need a copy constructor somewhere in there in my vtable um, and a destructor somewhere in there and also the accelerate method um, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Wait, close your eyes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm. I was there. Yes. No, I was there. Yeah. I was there. Yeah. Sweet. Um, yes, Bryce. Um, you mentioned this earlier, and I missed it. But why? Why is vehicles constructor taking uh, this template parameter by value and not by uh, a universal reference? Oh, uh, the question is why is uh, on line three, why is the uh, constructor taking by value as opposed to in universal reference? It's just laziness. This is slideware. Okay. It's, it's, just to make, it's just to skip a bunch of details. I mean, I'm also not, like previously when I, I, I did the manual implementation, I, I did not implement the copy constructors and, and assignment operators just because I, I, I'm trying to present the general techniques, not the specific Im, uh, implementation details. But of course, you would want to both uh, put constraints on that template parameter because unconstrained templates are, are like fully unconstrained templates are kind of bad, right? Um, they're really difficult to work with. And, uh, and also you, you want to use a to forward there um, for sure. So I mean, under the hood, ob obviously like poly, you know, if you pass it a, uh, a, a R value reference, it's going to do the right thing as well. Uh, it's just that this code is, is not showing it. OK, so um, some strengths and weaknesses of this approach, of this general small buffer optimization approach. Uh, well, the cool part is that it does not require allocating all the time. So you can actually save a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot by, by, by saving allocations, of course. Uh, the, 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 the little downside, though, is it takes up a little more space. So you have this bit of information somewhere, or you, you have this additional pointer in your object, and um, you also have the local buffer, which if you're not lucky and you happen to always have objects that don't really fit in the buffer, then you're going to still, you know, spending some, you're going to be wasting some space there having this buffer and not really using it. So it's kind of a trade-off. You kind of have to tweak the buffer size to your, um, to whatever makes sense for your application, but it's definitely a trade-off to, you know, you have to keep that in mind. Um, if, if you're basically never using the small buffer, uh, then you're really doing it wrong. You want to either not use the small buffer optimization or increase the size of the buffer to a point where most of your objects actually you know, take advantage of it. Um, there is also the fact that copy, move, and swap operations, which I did not show here, uh, they're more complicated. You have to consider, uh, essentially, you have to consider the fact that uh, all the combinations between like, okay, left-hand side is on the small, in the small buffer, in the, is in the local buffer, but right-hand side is not. And then left hand side is not on the small in the small buffer, but right hand side is, and basically there is like four combinations. So uh, that makes these operations more uh, a little more complicated to implement um, and a little less efficient as well. So there are there's this. I also remember there are. Um, I, I don't want to get into the weeds here, but there are also uh, some interesting exception. Uh, safety um, uh, uh, implications here because um, if you have, I, I don't want to get into the weeds, but I, I remember I think uh, talking with someone and and the conclusion was that in some cases it might be difficult to implement a, uh, a no accept move constructor. So you uh, you have to be you know careful about that. But it, it is possible. It just depends. Like if you want to give a lot of flexibility, like for. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to get, get into the weeds too much. But anyway, things to think about if you, if you, you know, want to explore this implementation strategy. Uh, and also, the dispatching may be a little more costly, because then you have to always either branch on whether you're in the small buffer or, or, or uh, on the heap, um, or, um, or follow just you know, an, uh, a pointer, which in that case is not really more costly. So yeah. So with regard to exception safety, you basically have all the same issues that variant has. 
So the comment is that with respect to um, exception safety, I have the same problems that Variant has, and I think that is correct. Yeah. I, think, I think that is correct, yeah. So anyone who's familiar with that? So anyone that's familiar with the uh, problems with Variant, uh, uh, they're essentially the same. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And I do not wish to get uh, into those. Um, so we can actually go f uh, further than that. We can, we can say that, hey, if it doesn't, comp uh, sorry, if it, like, we're, we're going to have a, a local buffer, okay? And we're never going to fall back to the heap. So we reserve that amount of space, and if the object's too large to fit in there, doesn't compile. We can do that, right? Um, I mean, that poses a restriction on what kind of objects you're going to be able to throw in there, but it gives you a lot, though, right? It gives you the absolute, it gives you the compile time guarantee that you're never make, you're going to make an allocation ever. That's really cool. Um, especially, I mean, I think if you're providing a library, maybe, maybe you're, you're a game developer or something, you're providing like a, you know, a base library, you know, performance is super important. Want to make sure that your coworkers don't mess up and uh, that they're not, you know, suddenly starting to use a lot of allocations. Use that and, and then you're guaranteed, you know, that they're not going to, uh, uh, I mean, they will not be able to, to, to use types that are too large that would normally, you know, require an allocation. They just won't be able to do it. So, um, so yeah, like I said, the idea is you basically have a local buffer of a fixed size, and you just you just static assert if the thing if the if the object you're you're put you know you're getting into the constructor doesn't fit in the local buffer. So that's the idea, right? So how it works? Well, you get some aligned storage of a certain size, and then um, interesting bit here is line six to eleven, uh, the templated constructor as always. Uh, Instead of saying, if you fit, then you get into the buffer. If you don't, then you make an allocation. You say, static assert that it fits. And then placement new into the buffer, right? And if it doesn't fit, I mean, it doesn't compile. So you get a nice, uh, you, get, you, you can get a nice compiler error for your coworker then. You're saying like, you know, make this smaller or, or ask me, you know, nicely to make it larger, make the buffer larger, <laughs> whatever, right? But um, you can, yeah, so you can do something like that. Uh, um, and then when you want to call a, a method like accelerate here, uh, you just always give it the address of the buffer. You know that your object is always there. Mm -hmm. And uh, just the same, when you destroy, you don't have to uh, uh, re uh, reclaim any memory. You just call the destructor and you're done. Um, and of course, the same uh, comments that we made with like launder and changing the dynamic type of stuff that all applies here as well. Basically, whenever you're placement newing into a, a char buffer, be careful. And um, with Dino, you change line nine again, and you say I want local storage instead. Give it this, you know the, the size, and it just does it right. And so you get a nice compiler error if if it doesn't fit. Questions about this general technique? All right. So uh, uh, of course it's really cool because you never get an allocation. The dispatching is super trivial as well. Um, the problem is it may take up more space, right? Because you're you always have this low. It's kind of the, like the SBO basically, right? You're it has the same downside as the SBO with respect to space. You have a buffer. You might not always be using it fully, so you might be wasting a little bit more, uh, a little bit of space. On the other hand, you don't have the overhead of a pointer to get you know to your to your to your data on the heap, so I mean it's kind of a it's a trade-off. Yeah, I don't think in this particular case you have a storage overhead because you're always using the buffer or you're not compiling. So the comment is uh, uh, there is no uh, storage overhead because you're always using the buffer and otherwise you don't compile. So where I see that you do have overhead, uh, just say, um, where where I see that you do have overhead is imagine that you have a buffer of of uh, you know 64 bytes for example and you're always using just 24 <laughs> bytes of it. Understood. You're always smaller than 64 bytes, but you're using the buffer always, right? Yeah. You're not. You never. That's that, that's it. correct. But some so you're always using the buffer. That's correct. But you might not be using all of it. Understood. So. Please. Yeah. So, so that's exactly, so that, that ends up being wasted space, potentially. Um, um, yeah. That was my comment. You, okay. You covered it. Uh, uh, Jason. Uh, for general use, is there like a recommendation for like a maximum size you'd want to use for one of these fixed size buffers? Uh, so the question is, is there a, a, in general, a recommendation for what is the maximum size that you, you, you want to use for these fixed size buffers? Um, 
I, I cannot give such a recommendation. It depends on your application. Um, it, I, I don't think I, 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 I can do that right now, really. Um, I think you have a direct answer. Uh, my, I have an example that, that matches your answer. Um, so uh, Andre Alexandrescu did, a, did his own string implementation for use of Facebook when he was at Facebook. And he sat down and he analyzed what is it, what do we do with strings at Facebook? Because most standard libraries use, you know, 24 or 16 or something like that. And he discovered that the overwhelming majority of the, of the strings that are passed around on Facebook are, in fact, post IDs or object IDs. Mm. And they are 22 characters long. And so he made sure that his SBO was, could fit 22 bytes and a null. <coughs> because mm, he needed to be able to have 23 characters into it. And that was a huge win for him, but it was very much the decision on how big to make it was based on his data. It was domain specific. It was so domain specific. Yeah. So for this, it's the same way. Yeah. You know, you can you can get different performance depending on what kind of types you put in there. Yeah. You guys, you you have to decide. So Marshall's comment is it was basically that there um, there's an uh, anecdote where um, uh, Alexandrescu, right? Yeah. Andre Alexandrescu. Um, uh, was re-implementing uh, the string at Facebook, and he noticed that most of the the strings at Facebook were uh, effectively post IDs, which are uh, 22 characters. Mm -hmm. So, so he made sure that uh, their string was able to to store 22 characters plus a null, so 23, and and that was a huge win for them. But it, it was really, really you know domain specific. So, it, so yeah, it's really hard to give a general guideline. Michael, would you consider this to be a closed set, just like the variant core problem? If you're a library writer, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, the question is, would I consider this to be a closed set just like, for, just like a variant? No. Um, so it is a closed set in, si in terms of the sizes that you can put in there, but the, the kinds of things that you can put in there is open. You can, put, like, you can put any, 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 any type so long as it fits in the buffer, right? So, you're not, so, so it's not a fixed set of types. It's a fixed set of sizes. From zero, effectively from zero to you know whatever buffer size you have. Does that make sense? Does that, does that answer your question? It makes sense. I just wonder what you, if you considered it open or closed. I definitely, I, I, I definitely think that it, it is open because you can create an infinity of types that have a size that fits in that buffer. As, as well as an infinity that won't. As well as an infinity that won't. That is correct. But you know, the, because there's an infinity of things that don't satisfy it, it doesn't mean that like anyway. If there's an infinity of things that you can put in in it that that satisfy it, then that's why I consider it being being open. Um, I guess we can do some philosophy there. Uh, yeah, Stephen. Well, I was I was basically going to ask about the same thing. It was like um, like how often do you think that this would actually be better than variant, given that I mean. Given that you actually have to, that if you have to know something about everything that's going to be put into this. So the question is, um, how often do I think this is better than variant? Given that I have, I always have to know something about, like all the types that can ever be put in there. Um, I, I I think it's really just the same as um, uh, the difference between, like for when you need. Uh, uh, open polymorphism versus closed polymorphism. I mean, if, 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 if you don't know what types you're going to get in advance, then you just can't possibly use variant. Um, so it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a compromise, I guess, uh, in between. But um, this is more, I see this more as a, as, a, um, as a fully open type erasure technique that you happen to put a bound, a cap on for, implement, for, for uh, optimization purposes. That's kind of how I see this. So I, I really, really see this as, be, as being open still. Um, so a quick, quick, quick benchmark. Um, um, th it's basically impossible for you to uh, read what, uh, the, the, the lines here, but it doesn't matter. Uh, so uh, from left to right here, so the f oh, uh, what this benchmark is, of course, uh, I'm creating uh, many 16 bytes objects. That's what I'm doing. I'm just creating them. I'm using Google Benchmark, so it's going like, to create a bunch of them and, and iterate until the variance is satisfactory and blah, blah, blah. Um, essentially, what I want to show here is just that when you do fit in, when, you, when you don't fit in, the, in a small buffer and you're making an allocation, it's costly. And when you don't, it's not costly, right? That's just what this benchmark is. It's kind of stupid, but so from left to right, the first one is an inheritance. So I'm always doing an allocation. You're paying for it. Uh, remote storage, then. Also, you're doing an, an allocation. 
uh, SBO storage with four bytes. Because I have a small buffer of four bytes and I'm creating objects of 16 bytes, they never fit in the small buffer. So I end up allocating, and of course I'm paying for it. Uh, just the same for a small buffer optimization uh, with eight bytes, where it still doesn't fit. And suddenly, the, um, um, the first one that, that's you know, fast is small buffer optimization with 16 bytes. Because it fits, suddenly I don't have to go to the heap, and it's much faster. Right? So this, this, like, this is all that this benchmark is showing is just, hey, if you don't allocate, it's faster than allocating. Right? Uh, and the last one is a local storage with 16 bytes, which of course never allocates. Shall we? Uh, a comment. I find this benchmark uh, misleading because Dino has memory management facilities. I think it would be fairer to compare with, in, with in inheritance used in conjunction with a specialized allocator, which would solve the problem, at least in terms of uh, the time you spend allocating memory via malloc, for example. So the comment is that this benchmark is, um, is misleading because Dino has facilities for uh, memory allocation, and so it would be more, it would be more fair or you know, not as misleading, I guess, to, to instead present uh, inheritance-based you know, uh, benchmark that, that uses a custom allocator. So my answer to that is, um, is that actually Dino is using operator new so it doesn't have any fancy allocators internally. I mean, what, what you could do for sure is like use a pool allocator, you know, for that and so on. That's, yeah, that's, that's true, but it's, 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 it's a different, you know, it, that, that's all based on the same allocator everywhere, right? So of course, if you start using a, a pool allocator, then you're gonna see all of, of these, all of these, you know, lines on the left that are currently high, they're gonna become, you know, much, 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 much faster. But um, uh, I mean, you do, No, it's different. Okay, so so it doesn't have the same consequence. So the, okay, actually, that's that's something I need to address because it was raised in Bristol and we talked about it in Bristol um, at ACCU. And um, uh, of, of course, you know, John Lakos was the one to bring it up. Um, it was like, hey, just use a pool allocator. So yeah, a pool allocator is gonna is gonna or just any you know good allocator that that you know fits for your purposes is gonna is gonna make these allocations basically go away right there is one important difference and so so that make that may make a lot of sense for you okay there is one big difference um, if you have a uh, it's a little bit hard to, to to explain but imagine you have a vector of these of these um, uh, small buffer optimized objects okay and assume or let's be even simple you have a vector of these local storage objects, okay? So they're all stored right there locally, okay? Um, and you shuffle that vector around, okay? You're actually shuffling where the data is, right? And so it, it's, fo it, it, it's basically following, you know, where, well, it, it, you're reordering the actual data. And then say you pass, you, do a, you make a pass, you know, on this data, you're in, in uh, cache order. You're gonna, you're, you're gonna be doing sequential accesses. If you have a pool allocator instead, you're holding pointers to something that was allocated in the pool. Sure, allocating was real fast, but if you shuffle those, suddenly if you traverse your vector you know, sequentially, you're making accesses all over you know, uh, the, the, the place in your pool. So that's kind of a subtle difference. Am I, am I being clear in my explanation? So, so that's kind of something to keep in mind here. Um, these local storage and SBO storage, they actually carry around the actual data with them. So if you move them around, uh, actually, that can be more expensive as well, right? Because you're moving more data around. But if you're moving them around, they're actually moving around. You're not just moving a pointer to them. So you can you know that if you do like sequential accesses, then you're you're you know uh, accessing them in the real order where they they live in memory, they they, they reside in memory. So. Um, yeah, we we I, we can discuss for maybe a minute, but no more. So. Um, Argument about locality. For example, at Bloomberg, we often use arenas, which are allocators which allocate from the stack. Mm -hmm. The stack is, uh, is, in, is in the cache. Um, if we're going to sort a vector uh, using, using you know, the old manner, a vector of pointers to objects which are stored in an arena, I don't think that we have a problem with locality. And also, syntactically, we can use uh, lambdas now, you know, like your example of so. Uh, whereas, you're going to actually shuffle blocks of uh, 64 bytes, some of the bytes are used, around. So it, it would have to be benchmarked, but uh, I, I'm, I'm I agree. very, very skeptical. OK, so um, I'm going to summarize this comment by saying that um, um, the person is skeptical. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> I, mean, I mean, no, no, but like, I mean, seriously, I, I mean, seriously, I think, I think, I think it's all about benchmarking at this point. Um, I, I don't think it's fair to say though that using a pool allocator or any any kind of fancy allocator you, you, you want, like there are still differences. So it might be better in some cases, actually, right? In many cases, it might be better. In some cases, it might be worse, though. So there, my point, I guess, is that they're different. And also, you have to use damn allocators everywhere, and that's not always fun, right? So it, it, this is kind of a, you know easy to like once it's implemented it, it's it's it, it's just like i know that my vehicle for my use case has these properties i'm optimizing it for you know that specific use case and nobody has to know about allocators anywhere so they're they're, they're you know i would say they're kind of a little bit different but for sure if you're considering this solution you should also you should think about your problem and you should measure it probably with with a custom allocator if you're really serious about this i was just going to make a comment i think we're missing a the forest for the trees here. This whole thing is to make value semantics out of our objects, if I'm getting it right. So these little details about object storage and layout, I mean, they come with the problem, but the, the problem is to actually make value semantics out of objects. I, 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 think, I think that's actually a great point to make. Um, uh, so the, 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 comment is, the comment is that we, we, we should keep in mind that what we're trying to do here, what we're trying to solve, the problem we're trying to solve here is value semantics with, you know, well, runtime polymorphism with value semantics. And we're just looking at implementation details of that, right? So the allocator, in this case, is not going to help you for that. So yeah, absolutely. So I think talking about allocators is, is interesting in terms of like, for a performance-related discussion. But as, as far as the actual problem we're trying to solve here, it's not really relevant. Um, and I would like to move on. So unless there are, OK, so I, I, we can talk about it offline. I'm happy to do that, but I, I want to move on. So um, I guess I want to give a, a few guidelines real quick. Um, I would say you should use, and this is all with KVS, so don't throw tomatoes. Um, um, use local storage whenever you can afford it, because then you're guaranteed that you, or whenever, whenever it makes sense for you, because then you're guaranteed at compile time you're not going to have allocations. So that's good, right? Uh, however, of course, it ties your hands in terms of the sizes you can use. But if, you know, if it makes sense for you, you should prefer that. Otherwise, I would say use SBO with the largest size that makes sense for you, right? A size that you know is not going to be wasteful because most of your objects are going to fit in there. And um, so it, you're going to save, like, usually you're going to be able to save the allocation, right? Um, and I would say fall back to purely remote storage only when you really can't figure it out with SBO, right? When it wouldn't help because the, the object sizes are really scattered, or 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 you, your SBO would would be would have to be so large that it doesn't really make sense, or or maybe you have like an allocator under the hood and it happens to be you know um, uh, you know fast enough or something like that. But I would say fall back to purely remote storage only when when you know the other solutions don't work for you. Okay. Um, now we're going to depart the, the realm of value semantics, actually. And um, um, I, I want to talk about it. It's kind of a view here. So it shouldn't be called storage, I guess, because it's not storing anything. Um, the idea here is basically we still have a pointer to the V table. And then we have a pointer to something, but we don't. it's a non-owning pointer. OK? So that gives you a polymorphic view, basically, over some data. It, it allows you to tie a, a, like any custom V table you want to data that already exists somewhere. Okay, it's like a polymorphic reference, if you want. So it's basically a polymorphic view. Um, so the idea here is, let's say I have a truck on line eight, and I call my function on line nine with it. I'm not making a copy here, because under the hood, it has reference semantics. Okay, so of course, you, know, you want to make it clear that, you know, that it's not owning anything. Otherwise, you, you, you easily get into you know, trouble, just like when you use string view. But, um, but that's it's kind of the idea, right? It's basically like a conceptually, it's like a string view plus a V table, right? And it, and it's not a string; it's something else. Um, so that's actually pretty neat. Uh, and you can implement it. It's like the easiest one to implement, right? Uh, you basically just have a pointer to something, and in your constructor on line seven, notice that now I'm taking a reference. I'm taking an any ref, right? Um, and I'm storing a pointer to that ref to that vehicle. So I'm not doing it in place new. I'm not allocating memory anymore. I'm just holding a, you know, a lightweight, just a pointer to it, basically. And, um, and then accelerate basically just you know, use, uh, uses, uh, calls the function in the v table with, with that, that, that 
pointer that I, I don't own, right? And the destructor does nothing because I, I'm not owning anything. So with Dino, you can just use uh, non-owning storage and uh, the, the non-owning storage policy, and you also need to make your uh, your constructor take a reference. I was just going to ask about that. Yeah. Sorry. So that's the idea, Jason. So the difference between this and remote storage is that remote storage owns. It's like a unique putter, right? Whereas this is like a raw putter. It doesn't own. Oh. See what I mean here? I'm, I'm, I'm taking a reference to the vehicle on line 7 and, and storing it on line 9. And it's, it's, it's like I'm not making a copy of anything here. I'm just holding oh, a pointer to the thing. It, then, it would not destroy it at the end. Exactly. And you need to make sure, you absolutely need to make sure that whatever you're binding in the constructor uh, outlives the vehicle ref instance. Otherwise, you're in trouble. It's just like a string, really. Mm -hmm. Steven? So how does this interact with like, const? That's a good question. How, how does it interact with const? Um, I have not thought about this, which means it probably does not interact very well. This is the const data, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, so well, I mean, right now, if you pass something that's const, it's not going to work, right? Because you're going to try to bind a void putter to a, to a, 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 a uh, any const putter, which is not going to work. But um, I. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think you need to go away and think about it. Yeah, I think I need to go and think about it. That's that's what Marshall says, and I agree with that. <laughs> yeah, I, that's why I love this conference. Um, so yeah, so that it's a it's an idea, uh, which obviously is not complete. <laughs> um, and. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you could you could implement cons vehicle ref obviously, and then store a void cons putter. The, the thing is, I just don't. I, it's not a satisfactory answer for me because I don't want to re-implement this thing right uh, twice. But I, I'm not sure whether I. I don't think I see a, a solution for that. We need a standard extension that allows you to pass just cons as a template parameter. <laughs> <laughs> Comment is we need a, we need a standard extension that allows us to pass just cons as a template parameter. Anyway, I'm I'm gonna fly now because I I have some more content I want to make sure I get through it. Um, with Dino, uh, shared remote storage. Okay, you can also use shared putters instead. Okay, so you can use like small buffer optimization, shared and, and whatever, but you can also use uh, a shared pointer. And the idea basically where it becomes really interesting is um, uh, the uh, Dino allows you to do that by just changing the policy. But the where it becomes interesting is when you do copy on write, right? So um, you basically the idea is you're sharing these objects as much as you can, and whenever you call a non-const method, if you call a const method, you don't do anything, right? You just use a, you follow the shared pointer, and that's cool. If you use it, if you call a non-const method, you make a copy, a deep copy of what is pointed to by the shared pointer, so that now you own this this thing, right? And um, and then you can operate on it, you can mutate it if you need, and that's not a problem anymore. So that allows you to uh, um, implement. Uh, as if it were like a persistent data structure kind of thing, or well, not a persistent, but like purely functional kind of stuff, right? Where you're, you're, you're making basically you you pretend that you that that you really own the thing, and you mutate it as much as you want, and it doesn't really matter because because you know that actually under the hood it's doing optimal sharing of state as much as it can. Marshall. Right. So I assume that then all the const methods run lock free, but when you call a non-const one, you you assert a lock to make the copy and then go on. So, so, so the the question is, um, all the non-const methods methods are lock free, and then the const methods would take would would take a lock and then and then and then copy it. Um, I would have to think about it as well. Um, uh, I I don't think you need that, actually. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking maybe not. No, you just need to make a copy, and then yeah, no, you just need to make a copy because making a copy is not going to modify the object itself. Right. I would. So you don't need that. Um, right. So basically, when you on line six here, when whenever you, um, whenever you, you want to make a, a copy, well, you just make, whenever you want to modify it, you just you just make a copy. So uh, it's interesting because it, it allows you to share a potentially expensive state, and it interacts nicely with con con uh, concurrency. Now I've had comments saying it's actually the other way around because short pointers are bad, um, and. Um, what I'm going to say is just watch Sean Parent's talk. Okay, this is not my idea. Obviously, um, this is exactly what he presented in his talk, and what he did there was basically this shared state was a Photoshop document, which is like 
large, right? It's really, really big. It has big pieces, and you don't want to um, you don't want to make you know copies uh, all the time. So um, so it worked really nicely for them. Uh, the problem is obviously it allocates and it uses reference counts. It's based on sharp borders. So the usual caveats apply. Um, and here's why you care about what we've been talking about for what for an hour now. Um, so have you heard of std function? Obviously, yes, right? Um, in place function. Yeah. Raise your hand if you have. Okay, so you're going to learn something today. And function, I say function view here, but it's, it should be function ref, I think. Uh, function ref, raise your hand if you've heard of it. Okay, so, so, so the in place function and function ref, or function view, uh, they are, um, they are currently progressing through the C++ committee. There are proposals, and the idea of uh, in of uh, well, the idea of in place function um, is basically a standard function which never allocates. And of course, it has a fixed size. It cannot hold you know any if uh, um, a, a closure type of any any size. It has just you know a fixed size. Uh, so that's essentially our local storage thing, right? And function ref is um, uh, function ref is essentially a, a lightweight view over a callable. So it's like a standard function which does not own the underlying callable. So imagine we had something like basic function, like basic string, right, basically, but, but basic function, which takes a signature and a storage policy. And then it's implemented hand-waving, hand-waving, whatever. It's implemented somehow. But it's implemented using, say you're implementing it with these uh, uh, policy-based thingies in Dino. Then you can implement all of these proposals, right, with, by just changing the, uh, the, the storage policy. So I think that's an interesting thing to keep in mind. It's, I'm not saying we should do that. We should probably not. But um, um, I mean, not right now, right? We should just go with function ref and in-place function probably because, because they're you know, good proposals and they're going to be useful. And this is going to take a long time before it's baked enough to even consider doing something with the standard, right, if ever. But it's good to keep in mind this pattern, right? The fact that we are implementing types that are actually just slight variations on, you know, on a on a um, on a theme, um, right? And I also have shared function. I don't think that's useful, but you can do it. Okay, so um, now we've talked about storage. I want to talk a little bit about V tables. I'm going to go kind of quick because I I I I'm I don't have enough time. So usually it's remote. It's it's a pointer to a V table. Uh, but we do have some choices. So um, what we can do is, one thing we can do is, is go crazy and just inline the vtable in the object, right? We could, like, each object that has a vtable could just be, like, really, really big and have all these function pointers right in, inside it itself, right? Um, probably not a great idea, but you can do it. Um, not important how it's implemented. Um, uh, Dino allows you to also customize the, uh, the vtable policy. So there is also a small domain specific language to do that. So I say my vtable is as everything locally, right? Which, which, which is basically the, 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 the language to say you're, um, you're inlining all the vtable. Um, and usually it's a pessimization. It's just no good, right? Uh, you're much better off having the vtable in the cache, there's like one vtable for what, a million objects, right? And it's, it's super hot, you're calling it like very often. It doesn't matter whether, like the, the fact that you're going through an indirection is like, is, is nothing. Um, and it's actually much worse if, in, if, if it is in the object, but it's more, more likely, because it's more, more likely to be cold, right? Because then you have basically a million vtables. So, uh, so that's not a really good idea. And yeah. There's also the branch target buffer that's gonna be different for every object in the same thread across. Can you repeat that? Right. Okay. So the, the so the comment is the comment is basically uh, uh, if you store the vtable right in the object, it's not going to uh, um, uh, play nicely with the branch target buffer, uh, which is a, a part of your um, CPU that that tries to predict where uh, where you're jumping. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, that makes total sense. So I also thought about doing okay. What about partial vtable inlining? Right. Maybe we can have part of our vtable local, part of our vtable on the uh, not on the heap, but you know through through a pointer. So. Um, so you can also implement that. Uh, you just say, uh, I want only accelerate locally on line 10, and then, then you say everything else should be remote. So you can do that. 
Um, and so you can, you can kind of go crazy with this, um, and it's fun. Implementing this took me, I don't know, like so long. It's like, imagine like generating your own V tables with like, you know, set theoretic operations that allow you to pick, you know, mix and match different, uh, it's just crazy, but it's a lot of fun. Um, but I would say it's probably not the best idea. Um, so usually it's not really an optimization. Uh, so instead, instead of, of saying like, hey, victory or whatever, I'm just gonna say, hey, just, just stick to remote vtables, okay? They work, they work nicely. But I do have a fun observation. I do have um, something I can share, though. And good presentation without Gutbolt is not a good presentation. So, um, whoopsie. Oh, no, no, that's not what I want. Sorry. Okay, there you go. Um, so here is um, uh, different implementations of, of um, can you see even at the back? Okay, I'm sorry, uh, let me, is that better? Yes. And this here? You don't even have space. Yeah, okay, so, um, so it's, it's just basically different implementations of uh, of the, the V table. And what I want to show essentially is that when the, the like the, the essence of what I want to show here is that when the V table is, um, is uh, accessed through a pointer, um, it needs to be reloaded on, um, on before every, like the V table pointer needs to be reloaded before every virtual call. Because you don't know whether the virtual call is going to actually change that V table, that, 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 that V pointer, okay? Um, so here, if we look at the remote any, which, no, no, if we, sorry, if we use, if we look at the inheritance any, um, you can see that, uh, and now I have a little note here, so the first load is, the first load, I think it's um, this one, he, no, 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 um, this one here loads the V table pointer, and the second one is passing this as the um, as the first function argument. And correct me if some like assembly uh, you know uh, uh, magicians uh, know better. And then the call is made. And notice that here you reload the V pointer again, and then you you know you set up the the the, the, the first arg argument. You pass the first argument and so on and so forth. So you always and, and here you reload the V table pointer again, and and you do that right. And the, the interesting part here is that if you use, if you look at the local any, where the vtable is local, um, it doesn't need to do that actually. It loads the vtable once, and, and then it uh, prepares the, it loads the vtable once, I think, um, I think that would be here, and, and then it prepares the, um, the um, no, sorry. It prepares the first the, the first parameter and it makes a call, and then it, it prepares the first parameter and it makes a call, and it prepares the first parameter and makes a call. So as you can see, I'm not really good at assembly, but um, but you can see that there's basically one move before each call, and here's there's two moves before each call. And the essence of, of what I want to show here is that one of them is reloading the vtable pointer because the compiler can't tell that the v the, the virtual call is not changing it. So that's that's kind of an interesting uh, uh, takeaway. Is this happening because the variable holding the uh, pointer is local on the stack and you know it doesn't escape. So if you're accessing something from somewhere else, then yeah. you still have to reload it. Yes. Effect yes. Effect oh, yes. Uh, I mean, okay, no, so what's happening here is that is that the compiler, because it sees the, 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 the function pointer, it sees a function pointer in the local any here, the vtable is, is, is right there. So the, the, uh, the function pointer is right here and it can tell that the function pointer is not escaping anywhere, yeah. right? So it can tell it doesn't change, it, like there's no way this is gonna change in between yeah. the calls. So if you had a reference to something coming from somewhere else, then you'd still have to reload, right? If you had a reference, it, I, I believe you would. If you had a reference, uh, well, actually no, because look, I have it right here. Uh, sorry, um, local any, it's a reference. So no, it seems not to be the case. And you're certain that's not it's not, it can't be inline. I mean, I'm not calling it. This is just a code generated for the, for the function. So no, so it, that doesn't seem, I would expect it to be the case, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Anyway, and um, actually the C++ standard would allow the compiler not to reload it. That's what louder is for. But the compiler is nice. They don't want to mess up our code too much. So 
so they don't take advantage of it. Not always. However, if you use dash f strict v table pointers, that changes the game. Um, so, so that, that uh, because the, so the, so the um, compiler, it, the standard says that the, compiler are, the compilers are allowed to assume that you know, the dynamic type is not changing from under you know, its feet without, without it knowing about it. Uh, and that's what launder is for, right? If you're doing something nasty like that, you need to use launder and then um, and the compiler is going to say, oh, okay, I can't make this assumption for that specific point pointer because that pointer was laundered. Um, but if you but if you use uh, dash f strict v table pointers, the compiler starts using uh, taking advantage of, the, of this optimization, and you can see that in the inheritance, any uh, suddenly in between the calls, there's just one move, one move, and and so on, right? So it does not reload the v table pointer. So that's, I think that's kind of just an interesting observation to make. Yeah, real quick. Isn't that the same thing that you're doing in local any by making your vtable comps? You're making your I'm saying you're indicating the vtable is not changing because it's comps, and there's nothing that's reloading at this point, so it shall not be, it shall not have changed. It's actually quite possible that this is why the compiler is able to make that optimization. Yeah. So the comment is, um, in the, on the, in the previous example, uh, is it possible that I did not need to reload the vtable because it was marked as const? And I, I believe that might, yeah, that might be the case. Anyway, so I'm, I'm going to fly because, um, yeah, um, I have another story about in, inlining, actually. Um, so uh, I had this little benchmark, and um, I had this little benchmark, and um, and so the first one is, uh, is the, this benchmark is just uh, uh, iterating over a sequence, basically, with a type erase uh, iterator. And um, uh, with static dispatch, it's real fast. And then with inheritance, it's kind of fast. And with Dino's remote vtable, it's also kind of fast. They're like in the same ballpark. And um, notice I have this little attribute no inline on line two here, just because I want to make sure that the compiler couldn't just elide the whole benchmark, right? Yeah, Steve. So I ran your benchmark, and I found I had to put it in a separate translation unit because it was Actually, even though it didn't inline it, it was still looking into it and figuring out what it was doing. Hmm. Really? Yes. So, so I pulled it into a separate translation unit and that fixed the problem. So that, you mean that made static dispatch not zero? That's what you mean? So. Or that fixed the problem? It, it, you know what I'm about to say, do you? Right. Uh, let me, let me. some other things. I think that thing was fine. Okay, let me let me let me keep going, and maybe we can talk about it later. I mean, but if you if you think that this benchmark, benchmark is broken, do tell me though. Um, so anyway, so uh, I just tweaked this little thing, right? I just removed the attribute no inline, and suddenly, um, whoa, Dino's remote vtable was real fast. Why? So I think what happened is this. What happened is the difference between that was pointed out uh, at the beginning of the talk. The difference is with inheritance, I'm going through a pointer which has a pointer to the vtable, and then the vtable. With Dino, I have a pointer to the vtable right away, and then I have the vtable itself. Mm -hmm. So that's one fewer pointer hops. And what I think happened is that the compiler was able to figure that out, to see through what I was doing, because there was fewer indirections. And I was really, really lucky. And in that case, the, like, I, it played really well with the inlining limits, and suddenly the compiler could say, oh, oh, oh here's what you're doing. I can tell what you're doing. Let me, you know, let, let me optimize this out. So, so the lesson, I think, is, uh, I mean, it's kind of a general lesson, and we all know about it, but reducing pointer hops can lead to in unexpected uh, inlining. And when that happens, um, suddenly, like, major optimizations can, can, can happen. Um, so the, it's not really about the overhead of virtual call function calls. It's, it's the fact that, uh, and I'm almost quoting what uh, Matt Godwell said, said in his talk, uh, it, it's really the, about the barrier that, it's cr that the, the virtual function is creating. It's, it's a barrier for the, for, the, for the optimizer. It can't really easily see through that. If it can see through that, then suddenly it can inline, and when inlining happens, you can do stuff like vectorization, uh, and you can reorder things, and it just becomes beautiful, right? So that's something to keep in mind. Um, I'm, I'm going to keep going. Um, uh, yeah, um, so guidelines, uh, don't mess up with the vtable layout. Uh, uh, <laughs> just, just don't, right? It's not worth it. Uh, but do watch out for places where you might be, like if you have something that's super performance sensitive, maybe you're a couple of hops, or maybe you, you're like, a, you know, just like a small inline um, um, uh, compiler tweak, uh, you know, away from, from a giant optimization. If the, uh, if the compiler can figure out what you're doing, then it might be able to, you know, uh, uh, make some nice optimizations there. So I wouldn't say go and play around with your uh, inlining limits, but unless you really know what you're doing, but um, something to keep in mind anyway. Um, 
And, and now um, I have five minutes instead of uh, 25 minutes for this, but the main problem is that it's a really, really big pain to implement. I don't expect anyone to actually um, imp implement most of these techniques by hand. Um, so what can we do about this? Um, so maybe we can make it easier by using reflection. So imagine you can define a struct vehicle like that. So it defines, that defines your interface with an accelerate method. And uh, imagine you have some magic standard poly uh, type, which reflects on this vehicle class. Uh, it figures out what the interface, what the API is, right? So that replaces my uh, weird DSL that I had for uh, defining I vehicle, if you remember. Uh, if I had that, and if I had some code generation facilities, perhaps my std poly could you know, uh, pro provide uh, the API that I want. So it might be possible to, to, you know, to do something like that. Um, with meta classes, maybe, it would be possible. Um, so this is all based on, on P0707, um, uh, and um, which is like the, the, the latest revision, I think, uh, from Herb's paper. And basically, um, uh, a, meta, uh, a meta class is, is a, a context per function which allows, which takes in a type and it returns a type. Here I'm returning by out parameter. But, um, uh, but I, would, I, would, I would create essentially the standard, the, sorry, the, um, the, my, my vehicle class programmatically inside this context per function, okay? Um, and so, and on line seven here, this, this syntax is just this, the current uh, straw man that I think we, we voted to go forward with uh, in uh, Jacksonville, if I remember correctly. Um, so it might be possible to generate these things automatically. That's kind of my point. Or maybe we could do it on top of concepts, right? Because we already have a notion of, of what an interface is, right? Of what a, a like, uh, um, of what a, uh, an API is in, 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 in C++ with concepts, right? Um, so what if we had a way of saying, actually, my concept, instead of being a requires expression, because deriving a v-table from those is insane, okay? But if, if we had a simple type of, of constraint, something like this concept requires any model to have an accelerate method which returns void. Simple, right? But, but that's like, just because it implements a function doesn't mean it's related. But that's all he cares about. So the but comment is, it, it doesn't mean that because it implements a function doesn't mean it's related. I mean, that's how concepts work, right? If you satisfy the expressions. But that's not what object-oriented programming is really about. That's not what, well, I mean, it, it, yes, it got the job done, but is that really, like, are these things all related? Is, is a truck related to a motorcycle because they implement uh, a function? The well, the, the question is, the, the, so yeah. the, the comment is, is like, is a car and a truck and a motorcycle really, are they really related just because they implement Accelerate? Well, I would say, uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what concepts are for, right? At compile time, at least. What I'm saying is just like, li I just want to lift concepts and, 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 and lift them to runtime, basically. A real quick, Bryce. Your, uh, your imaginary concept syntax sure looks like a concept Shh. syntax from <laughs> I'm not repeating that comment. <laughs> this is political. So, um, uh, no, but seriously, like, it, it is, actually, this would be useful to have on its own uh, because it is possible, it is somewhat possible to, to, to do that today using the concept syntax, but it's really tricky. You have to basically say, okay, does V, uh, okay, you say M percent V colon colon accelerate, so you go get the, the member, the PMF, right, the uh, pointer to member function accelerate. You make sure that this expression is valid, and then you, you check that the type is a pointer to a member function which returns void and takes nothing. This is super cumbersome, but you can do it. It's just like a big pain. So that is strictly a shortcut for you know, what I just said, basically. And it's much nicer to write. And it would happen that it would also be super easy to, de to, uh, to uh, derive V tables from, from, from this, you know, from a concept that only has these kind of, kind of constraints. So anyway, so that's, there's, a, 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 there's a maybe in there, right? Um, and then maybe we could have some library customization points. Um, I don't know uh, where uh, where where you define basically your interface in one of these ways, and then you somehow say, "Oh, hey, here's how I want you to um, to to store them, and you know, to to, to store uh, instances in there, uh, and to implement the V table." Now, um, this has a problem that you only have one choice, right, for all of the for for per interface basically, so you can't have you can't treat a vehicle differently in different places of your code base, which might not be good. That's just an idea. And here's my current strawman. 
um, based on like discussions with people around um, here and at the committee and, and just you know general discussion. Um, so what I would like is to have um, this this uh, this small tweak to this small addition to concepts, right? And then being able to pass a concept uh, like on, on line seven here to pass a concept as a template parameter because that's also something that's useful. Um, and then we could have a standard poly, which is customized on a concept that represents basically the interface that you want to implement. And then you can pass in whatever, whatever policies you want. And all of this would be, um, so the poly under the hood would basically reflect on the concept, figure out what the API should be, do some code gen to provide the right API, so to provide like the accelerate method and so on. And that would be it, right? Um, so, that's kind of where I'm, I'm, I would like to drive right now. And of course, I, I was hoping to have some discussion. We're kind of out of time here, but uh, I was hoping to have a discussion in this room. Um, I, I'm going to keep going, um, uh, but if you're hungry, I guess you can um, go <laughs> eat. So um, here's how I think we can get there. Um, I'm, I'm going to go fast. I'll try not to, uh, to uh, get into the break too much. So the first step would be to allow passing concepts as template parameters because we, we will need to, um, we will need to like, reflect on them, right? And I think that's actually something that would be useful. Uh, I think that's a logical thing to add here, and it shouldn't be impossible to, 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 to implement in Word because concepts are roughly you know, Boolean, they're basically meta functions, right? They're basically like Boolean uh, context per functions, roughly speaking. So it should be possible. I'm, I'm not expecting that this is gonna be too difficult. Um, and then we, we, we could do a bunch of stuff with that. Um, and then we should add uh, support for this new, uh, this simple type of, of declaration constraint in a, in a concept, right? So that would make it easier to define, um, um, that, that would make, make it possible to define basically a concept that, that requires this specific declaration, not only, not only a valid expression. Because these types of constraints are like super uh, easy, like if you look at them, it, it's really easy to tell what kind of vtable you should be generating. Like you know that given this concept, the vehicle which requires accelerate, you know the vtable should look like a pointer you know, to an accelerate method that takes in a, a void star, which is the, your implicit this parameter. Whereas if you just have a concept which is uh, sp specified in terms of valid expressions, deriving like a vtable, deriving what declarations, the, the type that is satisfying the concept, the, the deriving what declaration that type has is basically impossible. Um, it's been tried before and it's basically impossible. So, um, because there's a loss of information actually. B uh, the valid expression, uh, when you just specify a valid expression, you lose information that, was, that would be available if you specified the exact declaration you're expecting. And you need that information if you're gonna do something like create an archetype or, um, or create a vtable. Uh, and then we need to support reflection on concepts, which seems also like a difficult but reasonably natural extension to you know, the reflection we will you know, we, we, we already have a reflection TS right now, right? So we're working on it um, and we're, we're adding support for more and more things. It just makes sense. It just seems natural that we should also be able to reflect on concepts. Um, so if we can reflect on concepts, we can say maybe something like, hey, give me all your constraints. Give me all of your constraints that are just declaration constraints, for example. Um, and then Polly internally could say, could say something like, hey, interface, which is, which is a, you know, defined as a concept, right? First of all, assert that you only have declaration constraints because otherwise I don't know what to do with, with it, right? And then iterate over the declaration constraints and do some code gen with it and create a vtable layout from it and so on. Um, and then we need to add support for code generation. So that's kind of uh, what is planned right now. Um, this is like, I'm not just dreaming here. This is actually planned uh, in, in for, because of meta classes. So, um, uh, the idea basically is you can, uh, using a context per function, you can uh, inject code into a type, which here is represented as a std meta type. That's like a fancy compile, uh, compile time handle into the compiler's AST, essentially. Um, and you can inject, we have like this, this uh, syntax with arrow and then parens to, um, to inject some code. So that, that's like a strawman syntax that we're still working on. Well, we don't know exactly what it's gonna look like, but we, we will get eventually you know, some means of, of doing code generation. Um, and so given this class, for example, uh, this thing here, which just creates basically a new function with a, um, on line 10 here, it creates a new function with a, with a additional int parameter. 
um, it would, given the, the class uh, of their foo, it would just generate basically this, this, this new class here, which has the same functions, but with, with an additional parameter. Uh, and then we add studpoly. Once we have all of this, we, we, we add studpoly, which basically is, all right, studpoly is a class which is a templated in a concept, right? Representing the interface that you want to be erasing. And then you have a, maybe a storage policy, maybe not a vtable policy because it's not a great idea. Um, but maybe, I don't know. And then you have some magic vtable type, which is, uh, which you figure out by metaprogramming over your concept. And then you have some magic storage type, which is figured out from the storage policy. Um, and then you, your constructor is constrained on the concept that you use, right? That you're erasing. And so you fill the vtable and then you store the, the, the value. And then the interesting part is in line 15 and 16, where there is a, there's a lot of meat here, where for each method declaration in your concept, in your interface, you, 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 you need to code gen a corresponding method that goes through the vtable. That's pretty much it, right? Um, so real, real, real quick, how would we implement studpoly? Well, programmatically, of course, at compile time. Um, so I, I spent an afternoon just trying to, you know, get, like, just trying to get a feel for how that would like with all the latest proposals that we have right now in flight. Um, and this is what I kind of got. So the idea basically is, um, so make poly here takes the interface, the storage policy, and the vtable policy. And it, on line five here, I create a class which I represent as a constexper object by using reflexper, which is a, a keyword that basically translates uh, a, a type into a, a compiler, uh, um, sorry, a pointer into the compiler's ASD. Okay, so it's like a compile time representation of the type. It's like, an, it's like a type ID, but a compile time. And you can do more stuff with it. Um, and so then I inject the declarations into my type, right? So this, this target here is the, poly, the standard poly type that I'm, I'm trying to generate right now. So you inject the, the declarations you need, you inject the constructor, and then the cool part here is where, how you define the methods, right? So for each method in my interface, so I'm doing a range-based for loop over my, uh, I'm reflecting over my, my interface, which is a concept, getting all the declaration constraints. So um, uh, presumably that returns like a standard vector. Um, uh, that contains um, uh, method declarations. And I know I, it looks like I'm dreaming right now, but I actually have a paper in Rapper, uh, for Rappersville that makes vector constexper. So we're not like, we're kind of far from this, but we're not too far from this. We, we are working our way towards, uh, you know, enabling, uh, making constexper much more powerful such that we can do that sort of stuff. So, um, so this is all not there, but it's all in line with what we have in mind right now. So um, I iterate over my methods, the, method, the declaration constraints of the interface, and then for each of them, I inject a public method, which has uh, on line 10 the return type, right? And so type name here is a keyword that we would be overloading to take a, it, it takes basically, it, it goes from a, from a meta object that represents a type, and it refies that into the type system as an actual C++ type, okay? And then id expert here takes a compile time string and reifies that into an identifier in the C++ uh, program. And, um, and so here basically I have my result type, I have the name of the method, I generate the argument list, just the same as I did with the, the, um, the return type, and then I implement it by saying, go into the vtable, fetch that member of the vtable with id expert, so I'm refining into an identifier again, and then call it with the right you know, arguments. And then I return my target, which again is my standard poly. So what I've done is in, in this really fancy constexpr function here is basically generated a class. Mm -hmm. That's what I've done. But I've done that based on compile time information, and I have the ability to do that using like for loops, algorithms, containers, and stuff. So that's essentially what we call metaprogramming, right? Um, and because I'm kind of out of time, I'm going to skip how I, I made the vtable, but it, it's all the same, right? I'm just generating types at this point. I'm generating a, a, a struct that has the right function pointers in it. Um, and then I, I need to fill the vtable um, uh, with basically thunks that, you know, will call the statically dispatched uh, method under the hood. So this is just like re-implementing Dino with real C++, well, no, with imaginary C++ uh, as opposed to, but like, with imaginary C++ that has sane syntax, the real C++ syntax, as opposed to template metaprogramming. So that would be, um, that's kind of the metaprogramming we're preparing. So it's a bit of a long shot, to be honest, but I've got time. And um, 
I've got time and, and lots of friends too, huh? So, um, uh, but I think that, seriously, I think that most changes are incremental and they're kind of useful in isolation. So that's kind of what I'm, 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 I want to bet on because just getting all of this at once is no, 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 right? But um, I think that we can make, you know, small wins, small progress by adding, you know, bite-sized features that are useful on their own in isolation. And eventually we might be able to get there because I think solving this problem is huge. I think that inheritance today um, hinders how we design our programs. And not, it's not only about like performance and everything, it literally like it hinders how we design, how we think about, about our, our designs, right? And I think that's a problem. I wanna see concept-based polymorphism um, you know, be used way more. But right now the, the, the uh, barrier to entry is way too, way too high. So the goals is I want concept-based polymorphism without boilerplate, without performance penalty ever, right? Actually it should be better. Um, and I want to bring concept-based polymorphism to the masses because I think it's the right way to do concept-based polymorphism. I am, um, I am confident that we can, you know, with the help of some language features, I, I'm confident that we can make this happen in a kind of long term, maybe, you know, maybe after, maybe 23, something like that. I don't know, maybe even after that. I don't know, but eventually, right? Um, so in summary, um, the inheritance model is really just one option, okay? It's not the only one you have. So you may not, you, you want to consider that before you bake that choice in. Um, there are many ways of storing polymorphic objects. These are implementation details, but they, uh, uh, they, they you know, it's always a space-time trade-off, but you have choices there. And uh, V-tables can be inlined, but you should probably not do it. And finally, type erasure is really tedious to do manually, but we might be able to get out of this mess eventually. So thank you very much. The, the Dino library is available if you want to check it out. Um, here's a bunch of useful links and related material. Uh, I'm definitely not the only person that has, uh, uh, you know, explored this area, um, this problem domain. And um, I'm happy to take questions and to talk with you folks afterwards. Thank you.